Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, these kinds of things are enjoyable and they're fun for me to do. I hope they're fun for you too because uh, I, I, I do a number of them. I do, as, as Janet had mentioned, I, I locally, I live in Plymouth. My uh, studio's in Kingston. And I do do a lot of local uh, access stuff down there. Um, probably every couple of weeks I go into the studio and do an hour demo. And what I do with those is I take them and I put them up on YouTube. They'll run them locally. So they'll run them in the Kingston, Duxbury, Carver, Plimpton, Halifax, that whole area down there. But in order to do a little bit more outreach, I'll, I take the stuff and I put it up on YouTube. So um, you can always I, I go to my, you, you can YouTube me. What do you call it? You can link me or something. P. Anthony Visco. You just go to YouTube. You should be able to find the, uh, the, the videos that I do over there. Now, what I do, what I normally do is when I do these, because they're usually an hour long, those are an hour long, um, what I will do is I will do short versions of those to upload. Uh, and I use those. And if you really are interested in seeing the whole thing, you can either stop it as it goes, because I do like one, they're, they're like three or four minute versions of the hour. So you know, you, it's fun to see yourself paint quickly. I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but you, you look in the, whether you're an oil painter or an acrylic, or you, you, know, you take 18 days to do a painting, to see it done in two minutes or three minutes is kind of interesting to, to see. Um, but I go through that process all the time, and, I, and, and, it's, and again, they're fun to do, and a lot of people are local. I teach locally in Plymouth. So on Thursdays, I run, I'm, I'm teaching all day. I run classes in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. Um, but uh, moving on, I just wanted to let you know that I brought a couple of, I brought a portfolio of, of work over here. And at, a, at the break, you can take a look at some of those. Um, got some of them up over here. There are some books. I, I illustrated a couple. Actually, I've illustrated three children's books, two of them are over here. And the reason they're here is because my wife twisted my arm. She wrote them. And she said, you will take a few books. They're, they're children's books, ages uh, somewhere in the vicinity of five, uh, four to seven or eight or something like that. So if you've got grandkids, I assume there's nobody here young enough just with children. Well, maybe there are. But if you have, if you have grandkids, they're, they're great. Uh, they're great to uh, uh, give. And they're 10 bucks a piece. So I brought a couple up with me in case you want them. They'll be, they're over there. there are fly, there's a flyer over there with my basic history. And so it'll, you'll see some of the work. And uh, you can always see me online. Um, I'm, I'm, I, again, my website, pianthonyvisco.com. Uh, you can Facebook me. You can, you can block me out if you want. It doesn't make it. Whatever, whatever works. You guys are saying, I'm, I'm, I'm good, so you, uh, you can turn the lights off for, uh, as long as I can see what I'm doing. You know, you, you, good, that makes it easier. I don't have to worry about it. You can, I can't see you now, <laughs> so I can paint more comfortably. OK, so normally, what I'm going to do is, this is, this is what we're going to do is wet into wet, watercolor. I don't know how many of you are watercolorists. You work in oils or acrylics, but um, for me, watercolor is an exciting media. For me, um, it's the most challenging of all medias. I think that if you, if you can master wet into wet watercolor, uh, at least if you can get do, used to doing this stuff, you can get the basics down real quick and then go back and tighten up. Uh, and so if, you, if you're really doing a lot of watercolor work where you're doing layers, sometimes this is good because you can get the stuff down. You run the paintings down real quick. And, but again, it, it just depends on how we want to use it and where you want to go with this. Normally, and I'm going to do this right now. We're going to wet the. I'm going to wet the. I'm going to wet the entire paper. I'm going to saturate the paper, back and front. It's going to be a test tonight. We're going to see what's going to happen. Nothing ventured. Okay, so. So the the reason I do this is because I want the fiber. I want the fibers of the paper wet. Uh, and I want them as saturated as possible. They'll take the paint a little bit more. Better for me. And then I'm going to go back in here and we're going to start to look at, I'm going to wet the area in the sky with clear water. And we'll do this like step by step because what I'm going to do is we're going to go through the process of how I paint. Not so much doing a great painting, although we all expect that it's going to come out okay, hopefully it will. Um, but the process is important from my perspective. 
because it's, it's all about learning. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just basically wetting the sky area and it's saturating up pretty good because what wet into wet is all about is the control of the amount of water in the brush and the amount of pigment in the brush. So I'm wetting it down to, see, the, I gotta go step over here a little bit so I can see where I'm going, but I'm coming down to my land mass, somewhere where the waterfalls are, is in the, in the rocks. Are you all Wellesleyites? Is that right, is that the way you say it? Wellesleyites, no? No? You don't use, is that the correct, all right. I don't know, anybody here from New Hampshire? Oh, need them. <laughs> no long distance. Um, okay, so anyway, let's let's ba let's start the process of getting some. We're going to get some co sky color in here, and feel free to talk, ask questions, uh, do whatever you want. But I'm right now. I'm just taking my a little bit of cerulean blue and putting it in the background, and we're going to mix that up with a little bit of. Lizard and crimson here. And because one of the things I really believe very strongly in is movement in both the temperature, color, value. So temperature is important, so I want to go from a cool to warm in terms of how I'm setting this up. So I'm going to come in here with, get, pick up a little bit of yellow ochre. A little cat orange and get this a little bit warmer. I know you usually don't do skies vertically, right guys? Yeah. <laughs> I know it. Breaking all the rules. So so I'm moving into my French ultramarine blue with a little bit of um, lizard and crimson. So you can see what ends up happening here is that I'm getting sort of cool, warm, and then cooler over in this area. And that's going to be basically my background area. Uh, and that'll end up, as you know, with watercolor, what, it's end, what ends up happening is that this is going to get lighter. And it, as it dries, it'll get lighter. And it's going to all granulate together, hopefully, to create its own um, it, whatever happens, it just it, it paints itself in, in a lot of cases. So now that the sky is done, um, this may be a good place to stop and have a break. No. <laughs> it's teasing. All right, so here's where I want to go. What I want to do is I'm going to try to fill a little of this background with, with all of the trees, uh, the, the trees that are in the background. And all, they're all you know, needle trees, pine trees, whatever kind of trees we decide to put in there. Um, and this is where I want to get this, I want to get the glisten. You, you can see, I don't know if you can see it up there, well you really can't. Actually, you're seeing it a lot lighter than it is down here. Um, but uh, you want to get this thing wet enough so that it absorbs the pigment, but you want it also dry enough so that when I put my next layer of pigment in here that I can control the flow of that pigment so it doesn't just go anywhere. Um, wet into wet, dry into wet, that's, that sort of controls the area. Um, the, the only thing I don't do is dry on dry with watercolor. Because I figure if you're going to do dry on dry, paint oils or acrylics, you don't need to do it in watercolor. Right, so you're going to dry paper, you can put wet into the dry and that works too. Um, okay, so Strong colors, strong pigment now, a little bit more strong pigment, less water. You need a little bit of water, but not, you don't want it too, you don't want it too, you want it about here. It's the, that kind of consistency. That should stay, if you, if you take a look at, that's still maybe a little bit too wet. Let's get maybe a little bit of cobalt blue. Mix that up with my cadmium yellow or whatever it's whatever I'm using. Yeah, see this is a little bit still too wet. 
That's better. See, this, this, is, this is good because this, is, this I can control. It's, it's, a, it's basically a consistency of um, maybe soft butter, something like that. But it's controllable in that it's not going to spread everywhere. So I can start to put in some of this tree, trees in the background. Now, I'm using, I'm, I just got a mixture of olive, sort of on olive green. But I'm going to go back in here and do the same thing with some yellow. And, and this, this may sort of look like it's, I'm just all over the place. But believe me, it just, it'll work out fine. Um, maybe going to be six out of this whole thing. I tend to work, I don't carry a lot of colors with me, but I usually work with two blues, two reds, and two yellows, a warm and a cool of each, and then with some earth tones. So maybe there's a total of um, six bright colors and maybe three or so earth tone colors. Uh, I do love, this, this is a, uh, burnt sienna is an, it, great color for me because it's a great, it has that red in it and it works out pretty good. Um, this, so we can go back in here and we can build some uh, darker, darker areas in here as well. And as this, and you can see what ha ends up happening because you can layer some of this stuff on top and this is still all wet. Nice and saturated. So I'm, I'm working around this tree. And you know, of course, I left this dry when I did that. So hopefully no paint is going to get in that area. I'll do that later. But yeah, I, I, tend, to I tend to stay with uh, a minimum, try to stay with a minimum of colors. Um, you know, if you, if you really listen to the um, art supply companies, they'll have you buy 96 colors if they can do it. And it's just not, you don't need to do that. You can mix everything. And actually, if you mix that, everything um, using a minimum of color, you, can, you end up actually with a better palette, I think, of. OK, so again, what I'm, what I'm doing is you'll see me go work in cools and warms and so forth and so on. And as long as this is wet, I can control that. And I'm going to get, I'm going to get spread off of it. I'm going to, it is, it's going to, it will dissipate, softly dissipate and uh, give me a, more of an energetic piece, more of an energetic painting. Okay, so I've got my stand of trees that are in the background. And what I may want to do too is get into some of this stuff in the background that's sort of way in the background. And this is the other thing that you'll see me do from time to time is take the water out of the brush when I when I do this because I don't want to I don't want to put too much water back into the water. Uh, I don't want to put any, actually, but sometimes, you know, you, you run, you do, uh, unfortunately, because it's still a game of control. But so I'm trying, I'm, I want some of these trees in the background to have some distance. Okay, so I'm just going in here and just giving me a, I guess, I guess this is a, the, the way this is, I mean, essentially it's just shapes that I'm dealing with. So I guess really what you can, we can, you, what you can refer this to is abstract realism. I mean, nothing on here really is definitive in terms of um, an actual detailed drawing of any of these trees that are over there. It, it, it's, it's just all about shapes and movement in terms of value going from dark to light, 
uh, temperature going from warm to cool, and the change up of colors from one color to another. And th I think that helps to keep paintings exciting. Um, so, all right, so we got, we got something going on back there, and I'm gonna let this sort of softly dry a little bit, and then I'll go back and put a little bit richer, darker uh, pigments in here. The other thing that's interesting with watercolor is you can go back and you can lift some of this stuff out. Well, maybe you can't. <laughs> yeah, it's drying up a bit. I'll have to go back and put some wet in there. Um, but you can, you, you, know, you can wet it up and lift, lift some of this stuff out so you can let the light come back up, the paper, some of that, some of that white paper. As you know, there's no white in watercolor. Well, there is, but we're not gonna cheat and we're gonna just use the paper. The paper is your white in terms of transparent, when you're painting transparent watercolors, the paper is your white. So what you need to do, for those of you that don't paint in watercolor, is to understand that you need to stay to keep this stuff as light as possible. Um, so it, what I would normally, if, for instance, this, this area right here, um, as, as I'm coming down, I'm softly putting some water in here and I don't have, I have very little pigment in this at all. So that when I, when I come back in and I, let's say I want to warm, warm this up, I'm gonna keep this very light, and that's going to be my transparency. That's going to be my light 10%, whatever. Instead of putting white in there and getting, and tinting it, I have to use the, I have to use the water to, to do that. Um, this area here is going to be my waterfall. I'm going to leave that alone. And I've got a bunch of rocks over here. Um, and as I do these, I'm going to just sort of take give you an example, I'll take a rock and paint it up to a dry area, wet this area right here, and typically what happens, if I'm gonna do this as a, let's say a gray rock, brownish. What I'll do is I'll come in here and I'll mix my pigment up, and then from the bottom, allow that, now that's still wet, and it'll, it, it'll slowly uh, wick up into the wet area. And I'll just leave it alone. And if I do a series of those correctly, if I do them correctly, what'll end up happening is, is that I'll have, a, I'll have a nice series of rocks that are over here that'll actually look like rocks. Um, as this dries out, I've got to keep going back in here now. And start building up more, more docks. Even though it's, because usually what ends up happening is if you know light that filters through trees they don't get, light doesn't get into the underside of the tree so much, you know, the sun's coming down from the top, usually hits the canopy and anything underneath that is generally dark. But what's nice about doing it this way is that you get the general impression of that. You know, the characteristic shape of the tree is there by just these movements. Um, like like this, this movement here, for instance, skipping, skipping from area to area, so you get that light and dark effect that, that uh, works very well with uh, a lot of needle trees. In, in this kind of painting, it's all about the understanding and learning about essentially the characteristic shape of the tree, I guess. Um, you know, if, if I were doing it really, if I were doing a, a really tight rendering of this, would end up, um, well, you and I would be, would be here until tomorrow because it just, it, it takes so long to do. So this is a nice way to get a lot of this underpainting done and get the general values down and the general shapes down um, really quick. Uh, so if I want to have a, 
more dominant, a heavier tree over here. One is maybe greener. So it's a, it's a matter, it's we're just going back in here. I guess I got a big tree over here. I didn't realize that. Okay, so that's essentially how I usually handle most of this stuff. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to come down um, a little bit off of these this area, and I'm going to and I'm going to slowly start to build uh, my land. And the land is is shaped. It's going to come down into this area where there'll be all my water down in here, my waterfall over here. How many watercolors here? Oh, that's cool. Great. You all, do you paint wet? Do you paint tight? Wet. wet? Good. Everybody else? Wet? Wet? Well, I mean, if you, if, so you understand the process of, of, of pigment. I mean, the whole idea between this is the correct amount of pigment and the correct amount of water to be able to flow in here and, and, and allow it to do whatever it wants to do. And I, I can tell my students a lot of times, because we want to rush this and we want to go ahead and paint it. We want to paint it. And if you leave it alone, it'll paint itself. It's amazing. I mean, you know, the, the sky, if you, it, it, you, you can see what happens. It's just it's softly granulating together. And I couldn't try to, I mean, if I try to, if I try to paint that uh, wet onto a dry paper and get that, I don't, I'm not going to get the same result at all. So. This is this is why you know you sort of work with you work with the flow of the piece and some of this stuff I want to go back in and I can when you're painting wet you can go back in and do this kind of stuff here which basically scrapes out some of the lighter areas um, you know come, if I want to do the base of a trunk I can do it something like that I don't want to get too far askew here but. Okay, so we want to change up a little bit. Get some little bit brighter colors in here. And I'm going to take advantage of the softness over here. And let's assume the light is coming from this way. So I'll keep this light, and we'll put this all, all this area here is going to be done. We'll do that in, in, a sh in sort of a shadowed, a shadowed sort of tone. It's sort of interesting to see the different approaches that people take when they paint this stuff. I, um, I just had a just came off a week, a week workshop up in Portland, Maine uh, with a guy by the name of Alvaro Castanet. Anybody know who he is? Yeah. Well, Alvaro is a kind of a, he's a character. There's a, there are three of these guys, three of them that I, I know. Joseph Zubakbeck, who I did a, about three or four years ago, I did a workshop with down in Plymouth. Um, guy by the name of Herman Pickle and Alvaro Castanet. And they, they, they did something that's very interesting. They did a, a piece together, all of them, on a, I, it must have been about 14 feet long, wide, you know, wide high. Uh, and they all take, they're tonalist. They don't use color too much. They're, they're, they're all tonalists, and they paint very interestingly. But they, and they paint similarly. They, they have the similar style. But I watched, I spent a week up there, and Alvaro, did, he did two paintings a day, and in 20 minutes he had his paintings complete each time. So it, it's amazing to see the man work. He's just inc absolutely incredible. Walk around, take a look at a spot, outdoor painting, look, OK, that's what I want to do. Put his base color down, underpainting down, take a dryer or something, or put it out in the sun, let it dry, bring it back, 
and he'd finish the painting up, and I'm serious, within 20 minutes, half an hour, that painting was complete, done, signed, ready to go. So, but he's been doing this stuff for, what, two a day for 30 years, I guess, so I guess, I guess you, you sort of learn after a while um, when you go through this process. But you can learn a lot from a guy like that. It just, uh, it, you just have to sort of sit back and let it go and watch him and go back and practice, I guess. So usually, again, going through and doing my rocks, if I'm going to explain the process, I'm, not, I'm leaving a dry area up in the top. I'm painting basically around. I'm going to do them in multiple colors too, by the way. Um, for, we'll come in here and do, do one this color. That's my bottom. Try and leave some white area where the sun, if it's coming down and coming this way, it'll hit the top of the rock. But see, just doing this alone, if you, if you can, I don't know if you can see, but you can see what happens. This sort of forms its natural shape and if you just allow it to paint itself and allow it to do whatever it wants to do. And don't push it, don't struggle. Um, don't try to paint it. That's what I tell my students, let it go. Allow, allow, them to, allow it to paint itself. rock over here, either side of this tree. And it's all about using, you notice I'm still using my one inch brush, I'm not going beyond that. Um, don't want to get too detailed too soon. That's the, the reason for that is, actually, the bigger the brush you start with, the better. If I were working on a full sheet, if I were going to doing, like I did that piece, I was going to do that big piece that I have over there, um, and I did it yesterday, and it just took me too long, and I wouldn't have got it, I wouldn't have had it complete uh, for this particular venue. So I decided to do it on a do something on a half sheet, see if I can get it complete. You know, mm -hmm. guys give you guys breaks and allow you to have a cup of coffee or whatever. And you'll also notice that every once in a while, instead of adding color, I'll just go into clear water. Well, that's not too clear anymore, but clear water, and then come down and just drag the drag the what is, exists as color here and there down. Soften this up. This is going to be cliffside anyway, so it's okay. And it's a balance of lights and darks, large shapes, small shapes. Um, just generic shapes, by the way, a lot of times. And I'm constantly sort of looking at this stuff and trying to just make sure that everything balances out. I just came from, yesterday I came from, uh, we did a, a, our annual meeting at the New England Water Color Society up in, uh, up at the Embassy Suites in Waltham. And the president and two other ladies all got together and did a painting uh, after as a demo, and it was kind of cool to watch the three of them together. On a, they, they did a four by eight sheet, and it was just real, really interesting to see what, what how they all sort of molded together using the same palette, and they worked together to get this thing done. It was fun to fun to watch. Okay, so where am I at? All right, so I want to get this thing here. I got sun coming down over here. We need a little bit of shadow on that side. Here, um, keep this nice and light.
Well, yes, I do. I don't do it in demos, but I do paint in 300 pound paper a lot. I actually, I paint on anything. I mean, it, it, it's funny to say, but I use a lot of, a lot of times when I'm in, when I'm teaching, I'll use um, 90 pound a lot of times in class. Every paper, and I use a, a variety of papers too. I, I, right now, this is, this basically, what I'm painting on here is BFK Reeves print paper. Um, I like it because of the soft fiber of the paper. It's, it's just, and it gives it, I mean, arches, I guess, for most of you that paint watercolor, you're probably all working in arches. Uh, and arches is most forgiving. I mean, you can put tape on it and lift the tape. I can't tape this. I, as soon as I, if I peel this tape off, it's gonna rip the fiber. So I, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a tape, or it's not a paper that I can successfully Let's say mask. Some of you guys, I'm sure, use masking fluid uh, to mask out the areas that you don't want, and you'll put everything in. I've got to paint around everything. I don't like to use masking fluid. Not that you shouldn't. It's just me personally. I don't like it. Um, I figure for the amount of work that I put in to mask, I'll I'll go back and use white opaque paint. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not going to get into a, you know the argument of being a purist. When I first joined the New England Watercolor Society, when I first started looking at the New England Watercolor Society, I really believed that watercolor really meant transparent watercolor. You guys, and you know if you're a signature member like I am, that you can use any opaque paints in watercolor and they will accept it, whether it's the American Watercolor Society, the National Watercolor Society. You can now use, and you can paint on Yapo, Yapo, I don't know, that plastic paper, whatever. Uh, um, I don't use it. Um, the only thing that you can't do with the New England Watercolor Society, and a lot of them is paint on canvas. But as long as it's on paper, you can use acrylic on paper. Acrylic, it's a polymer base. I don't understand why any watercolor society would take acrylic. It doesn't make sense to me. It just it doesn't, doesn't work in here. Um, but they do. So. If you, you, you guys that are acrylic painters, hey, spend 20 bucks, join the New England Watercolor Society, enter the shows. I'm telling you, it just, it just, you, you need to do it because you don't need to be a transparent watercolorist anymore in this, this industry. The only, the only uh, well, the Transparent Watercolor Society still is very, that they're, they're purists and you can't use any opaque at all. But other than that, Every one of the organizations will accept the, it, it, anything, it, it, egg tempera, uh, any, anything, as long as it's water-based, they'll accept it. So there you go, see? So you don't have to, you don't have to learn to do this stuff anymore. I, this happens to be, good question, what is this? Um, I, this is a natural hair brush, but it's, but I have, I found that flat brushes, I, this is a flat brush that's a synthetic. Um, I don't, the only thing that I, I, I will use, my flat brushes I will use is synthetic brushes. I don't, that doesn't make any difference to me. My round brushes, and I probably should explain them, and you know, if I were really a good I, a presenter, my round brushes um, are all natural hair Klonsky I can't do that, right? Because this is the library, so I can't, I can't. But you know what's, what's nice about it is that this is, the, I can get a nice fine point, and it'll, it'll maintain. It's a natural hair brush. Uh, these brushes have been with me for a long time. And uh, it, they, these were made by Strathmore. They, actually, they don't even make them anymore. Winsor Newton or Strathmore, either one. I can't remember who made these, but I've had them for years and years and years. And they still hold a nice point. So. I, I have that kind of brush. I use this, which is a squirrel brush, which a lot of times I will paint with. And when I'm dealing with large, uh, large areas of paint, I'll, I'll paint with this. And this holds a nice bead. And although it doesn't hold, it flattens out more because you can see what ends up happening. You get this bend. But, there, but there's a reason for that. And you, you can, as long as you understand how the brush is and what the brush is going to do, you can then effectively paint with that as long as you know ahead of time. The problem is, is that most people Get, you start using a brush like this. I've painted a whole painting, including nice fine lines with this brush too, as well. 
So it's just a matter of, it's brush discipline. This is a squirrel brush. This is a lang nickel. Look at this. This is a, but it, it and, and this thing here goes, I mean, you, this thing does, you know. But, but I use it for certain types of things that I want to do. I can't tell you what right now, but there are certain things that I will do with a brush like this. And a script brush the same way. Um, or a rigger, however you want to call it, but a long, you know, one of these wonderful long-haired, thin brushes, which we'll get to up here, because when I start putting in all of the tree branches and everything else, I'm going to go to a brush like this to do that with. But generally what I'll do is I'll stick pretty much with one brush for most of the painting. And when I went to school and learned how to, I didn't learn how to paint, I went to three, I took like, he's, like, like Janet was telling you, I graduated out of the New England School of Art and Design and, and the school in, uh, in, what is the other school down in New York? <laughs> visual Arts, School of Visual Arts in New York. That's the brush. I, I, they gave, I had a natural Klonsky Sable one inch brush, the only brush that I was allowed to use for three years. I couldn't use any other brushes. So I had to learn how to paint everything, thin lines, thick lines, thin to thick lines, everything with this flat brush. And, and I did. And when I got out of school, I couldn't paint. I mean, I didn't really learn how to use it properly. It took me a long time to get there. Um, and it took me a long time to get into the wet into wet kind of painting that I do right now. Because I've traditionally, I've always done, uh, when I started to paint again, I always did a little tighter painting. I didn't do it like this. I didn't work like this at all. I had to relearn the process. Um, because I, I found it was easier for me to go ahead and paint tight paintings. Layered, over layer, let it dry, do another layer, let it dry, do another layer. But this stuff here is much more exciting to me and I, and I just like working with it. So anyway, um, we'll go on and continue. Learning to paint. Something red, cadmium red. I don't know what it is. But what I was, what I'm trying to do is to get a strong. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go back and put some. I'll get some more neutrals in there, or put, a, make it a little purple, a shadowish. I just want to get some tonal value in here that's a little bit stronger than what was there because I found that it was sort of dying. And actually, it looks brown up there, but it's a strong. I got a strong red over here that I'm working with. Um, So I've got this stuff that's happening over here. I'm going to end up, we have a shore. We'll make this sandy. I'm going to. We'll do something like that over there. I want to put some, so my waterfall is over here. I moved it for some reason. I'm going to get to this point where we're just going to let everything set for a bit. We'll, have, we'll take a break and I can come back and I can sort of take a fresh look at it. And what I'm trying to do here is to create real dark, a dark, dark area over here and I want my lightest lights against my darkest darks because I'm, this is a directionally, I want you to look in this, this area. What you'll see, I don't know, but whatever it's going to be.
So we got that coming down here. We got some sort of rocky outcrop over here. My waterfall. Over here. Some rocks and some water that's going to come down this way. So we we'll see it slowly starting to take shape. You can get a feel for moving back in direction because the idea is that you want to you want to do that. One, I'll do all this foreground stuff at the end. This big tree at the end. A couple of these trees over here will sort of do them. But I'm just trying to get all of this stuff where I want it to be, um, so that I can I can uh, give you a feeling of movement into the into the piece where the water's coming down and all of the stuff that's going to happen over in the background. Actually, what I think I'll do, let me just do something here. Um, let's take a smaller brush. Uh, let's see, let's use this one here. Um, what I'm going to, we, we need sort of a focal point back here a little bit, I think. So I'm going to come back in here. Um, hang on for a second, guys. Well, I guess I didn't take it with me. Okay. I just have to be careful. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to put in I what I'm trying to do is to avoid, I know I'm bending over, but I'm trying, I don't want to put my arm, I've done this in the past, where I'll come down and I'll hit this and just everything is going gonna, is gonna to go. So I'm sort of trying to stay away from, because we're dealing with, we're dealing with wet paper, but let's put a cabin back here maybe, or... Just trying to get something something back here that's a little bit more interesting than just okay. So we'll do something like a roof line there, a little shadow there, maybe one over here. Um, and these are just little shapes. Nothing major. Okay, so we got something that looks like some homes back there. Let it dry out a little bit, and then we can we'll work off of that. Okay, so these are trees, so they have to have something going on here, right? So we, what we need is we need some structure. So we'll start putting in some of this stuff. Which will give me the impression And maybe some over here. Bring Sorry about that. They're going to kill me. 
Hold on. Keeps falling off. Paul, I'm sorry if you're there. Can you hear me okay? Is it a little, is it all right? All right. So what I'm doing is I'm just putting in some of the tree work, some of the branch work to help this along. Normally I do this at the end. What time, what is it? What is it about? Quarter of a quarter of eight? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna break in about a minute and a half of here so so you guys can have some coffee and do whatever and then we'll continue this. But what I'm basically doing, part of the process of making sure, making this look realistic is obviously getting some branches that are in here. I mean, they're pine trees, but you don't want just those shapes alone. So you want to be able to come up here, and the, and the idea behind this is not to go into the dark areas necessarily, but into the light areas where you'd see some of these. And this is, this helps to create the illusion of um, of trees and tree okay so it helps to create that background scene that we want and what I also want to do is come in here now and I have a big I have a big tree over here so I'm going to make this a little darker behind here side as well. And we'll make this a little, this a white. A white a whiter trunk, lighter trunk anyway. Okay. Okay, so why don't we take a break, put the lights on a little bit, relax a bit, and uh, have a cup of coffee and we can go from there. Lights go down. Everybody get back to their seats. All right, so we're going to continue with this. I want to just get going. Um, So what I'm doing is I'm just filling in some of the background a little bit more with uh, some darker images. As you know, you guys that came up here and took a look, this is a little bit different than what's going on up there and that it's a little bit brighter, but you'll, you, you'll get the idea. And so we're playing with darks and lights is what we're doing. And considering we're using needle trees, I want to get these, uh, just the general shape of this stuff. And I'm going to outline this, because this tree trunk here is lighter than the background, the stuff that's going on in the back. And we're just changing up the tone a little bit. Okay, so we'll pop that out a little bit more. Okay, so moving on, let's get, we'll go get into these rocks a little bit more. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and mix up a little bit of blue and a little bit of, um, I got this, this rose color, this, it's called opera. Um, it's really nice. It gives you a nice sort of 
purplish color that is softer than the than alizarin crimson. But it, you, somebody asked me, yes, I mix all my colors. I don't, I don't use anything out of a tube directly. Unless the only thing you'll see me do at the end, I may throw a couple of figures in here, and I will use straight color out of the tube to do that with, to do the shirts or the pants or something like that, if I decide that it's needed. This is getting a little bit, guys, this is getting a little bit overworked over here. A little bit muddy. So you'll have to forgive me for that. That's, but I want to get some of this stuff in here, a little bit more of these here, which helps to carry this. And you notice when I'm, the way I'm handling this is as I'm coming up, I'm, I'm moving in 30 and 60 degree. I'm coming off the branches. Uh, even though branches in a tree will come off sometimes at right angles, they, it just doesn't look right when you're painting them. Um, and the way I handle this, you'll see this, this tree, this, the tree trunk that I just did here, it's darker up at the top because we're going to assume that it's closer. I'm going to put a little bit more darker in there and make it a little darker. Wait a minute. Hang on for a second, because one is hitting the other, and I don't want Paul to get angry with me. So forgive me. Move this up here. Maybe a little higher. I don't know. God. OK. Can you hear me? Yeah, you should be able. Should be fine. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep this. I've got two mics on. Okay. Anyway, where were we at? So we want to get. We need some more definition in this. So let's do this. We've got, a, we've got a rock over here. Got this rock here, and the shadow's going to be in this side here. So we'll start, we'll do, get, start getting this darker over here and here. And I'm going to sort of move around, move along a little bit more quickly. My rocks are just nothing but shapes. But I'm hoping that some of these darks against lights will work. Okay, a series of rocks that are coming down here. And uh, I'm going to end up with some shadow from this tree that's going to come down this way over here and across some of this into that area right there. Um, we want to get some light area. There are three colors that I carry that are a little bit more um, opaque, I guess, if you want to call it that. And that is, I, I carry a lavender, and I use it very sparingly, but I carry that. I carry Indian yellow, which has a lot more white in it. They have there's certain colors that have a lot more fill. Actually. Uh, cerulean blue has a lot more pig more filler in it too, but in general, um, what ends up happening is, is that some of these colors tend to be more opaque in nature and white in nature, and the way they manufacture them. So most of the stuff here, all of the cads, the reds, uh, the, the staining colors, and so forth, are much more transparent. Um, but. I, Excuse me, I'm sorry. I find Indian yellow to be a nice color to work with. Um, and I can go back in, which I will I show you what I mean. If I want to take and do something up here to bring some of this stuff back, I can throw some Indian yellow in here and get these little holes. It makes it more interesting. So you can bring some of the stuff back. And I can do that with a lavender, too. Since this is a this is a process piece, 
So you can go back in here, for instance, with the lavender and do the same thing by just dropping some of the stuff in here. And it can, it can create, you can get some of that back without rubbing it out. I mean, I don't want to, I can start to go and also put water in there and lift it a little bit too. But it's a, it's a way to get around. Because like I said, I don't mask. And, and this is a nice way to do it for me. So I've got all of this stuff going. I've got a waterfall. Now, here's my water. This is where all this stuff here is going to be. What I will do is because this is soft um, there, and it's going to be soft up here. This is the suds, or the, the you know as the water comes down in the fall. We'll, we'll do something like that and allow that stuff to come down, and maybe it looks like we got something happening over here too. Maybe a little bit of that. Whoops, it's green. something that's over there. And, and because this, the water's coming down, and this will all sort of bubble up. Um, in this area right here, we're going to end up taking my taking that area and giving it a little bit of an edge because that's, we'll, we'll give that a plane. So you'll be walking sort of in your sand that way here. So I've got something that it can stand on. And I probably shouldn't be using this brush because it's really too small to do this. sort of interesting movement. And again, we're dealing with basic shapes. So what we need to do right now is, because the water's coming down this way, we got this stuff will all be end up, end up being water. Get some nice bright, leave some of it white, and allow it to flow down. And this is what gravity does, which is nice. In the same way with all the stuff over here, let me come down this way too, and we'll use a little bit more of my cobalt, or cerulean, plus maybe a little bit of cobalt blue. Get into this area here. OK. So we've got this sort of nice, soft lake, water, stream, whatever. We'll darken all of this up. All of this stuff here is going to be darkened up. And we've got reflection, obviously, in water, right? So um, some of this stuff is all going to be deeper, darker. So. Pretty good. OK. So what's interesting here is this. Now, I got a couple of big, I got a big tree that's over here. So what I'll end up doing is I'll bring in some, uh, where I'm standing off the paper is land. 
So this, this big tree is coming over here, and you've got all kinds of stuff gonna, that's going to happen here. So the way we want to handle that is I've got to let this dry a bit. Actually, let me put this over here. I want to let that dry a bit. Um, let's take and do some shadow work. Now, if the light's coming this way, this, this should be, that's my aesthetic license, because this, the light's coming in this direction. So really, you wouldn't have a shadow this way, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. Well, don't we, have, don't we as artists have the right to do whatever the heck we want? I mean, you know, come on. You know, we don't have to be true to nature. If you're true to nature, if you, you know, there's such a thing as copying something. You can take a photograph and copy it exactly. Or then, or you can paint from in here. You can paint from, you can paint from the heart. But anyway, we're just going to play around with this. And let's assume there's a lot of stuff happening over there. And they're just casting. Hey, there's trees that are over here that are casting shadow. You know, we, you don't know, whatever. But it's this fun stuff that makes this stuff interesting. This just right. now this is this we can be true to an HD ago. Dump a shadow in there and maybe drop some from the trees that are over here. So we've got this sort of busy kind of fun thing that's going on. And we have a, this big tree over here. Right here. Look at this. We're just going to soak it up. We're going to see how this is. This is what I like about this, this type of painting. So we use water. And we'll do two. What? Yeah, I use I use photographs, except that my photographs I use as reference. I won't. I don't necessarily copy a photograph. I'll take them and I mean I have. I'll use the same photograph over and over and over, and I'll do a different painting from it. As long as I can see structure, I have to see what I'm doing. I I can't paint. Well, I suppose I'm painting this out of here, but I generally don't paint. Um, I need to know where the light's coming from and where the, where the values are in a painting and so forth. So I will take a painting, and you'll see me, I take a bunch of photographs. As a matter of fact, I've got a bunch of them here that I'm not even paying attention to. But I bring them because I want to throw some people in. I'll take reference over here from, from some people. If I want to use fine art, I mean, I want to do all of this detailed work, I'll, I'll use these as reference. Um, you know, I want something that's really dark, a dark background in the front, I mean, a dark foreground. I'll use these as reference. So I carry this stuff as reference. But I don't necessarily paint from them. I don't actually necessarily copy them. But this, if we handle this correctly, let's see if we do that. So this is wet, right? So let's, do, let's come down here and let's do this from the, from the, from the top down. And let's do this from the bottom up. Now, if I let it alone, and I just don't bother with it, slowly this thing here will wick down. Slowly this will go up. And I'll create, I painted my, my tree trunk with, not, with, with very little effort. With little, you know, I may want to may want to come down a little bit more with it because I left a lot more than I wanted. So maybe I want to soften this down and come down a little bit. Okay. But, it's, but that's, it, in its simplicity, that's all you really need to deal with. All right? And that's enough. I mean, it, even over there, even there, I, I have to do something around here. I'll do that later to cover that in, or I'll make that a little fatter tree. But leaving this alone, don't touch it. Let it alone. The water will, will, will be the, the painter here. It's going to just automatically just do whatever it wants to do. And you can create, without really a lot of effort, 
Um, now, now, now that I said that, I'm going to go back in there and just screw up, right? But w my point is, my point is, you can without, you know, I, I want this dark on t under up here, and the reason for why I want a dark under here is because I've got all every up here, off the page somewhere is all of my all of the branches that are coming off the trees and the, all, all the needles on the tree, and it's going to create a, what shadow underneath. So if I do this like this and I darken this up. You can see basically what, it, what ends up happening. And if I do that and I just hit the dry area a little bit, you create skips coming down that help the characteristic of a bark on a tree. So, and then you can, maybe I want it a little bit redder. I don't know. We'll just see. So make, make, make this a little brighter down here. It's all right to do that. Too. All right, but just basically, if I leave it alone, it just becomes its own th its own entity. It just it works, um, and you don't really have to do anything to. To make it believable, I mean it's it, it's fine, and now, so I can say okay, so from here. Let's do something like that. It's got a branch that's coming off the tree. Okay. And maybe we'll, little one over here, a little stub. This broke off a little while ago. Um, and I can come out with something like this and And I don't know. I mean, we can continue doing it, but let me go over here, and we'll just do this one. All right, now, everything has to be anchored, including this guy. I mean, there's nothing worse than having something that's just floating around. You know, you've got this nice tree that comes down and it just doesn't go into the ground. It sort of just sits on the top of the ground and doesn't. You know, you, it has to be anchored. So therefore, part of that anchoring process, even here, would be maybe, maybe some high grass that comes off the page. To help carry that. So you get the feeling that there's something down here. Maybe actually what I'll do, even, even that, would we'll probably just do this. Just get, let's just make it a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Piece of land. Um, This, again, what I'm, what, I, what I'm doing here is actually creating some lights against darks to give me, you know, some, some general, generally, you, you, you create some interest. You want always lights against darks and so forth. So that's what I'm basically trying to do here. And I want to go back here, too. I got this light. Let's see. Well, I suppose that's OK, because that light works. Yeah, I'm going to leave that alone, because that light works. That's fine. That, that actually looks like, OK. I tell you that now, and then I'll go home, and I'll finish it up differently. Okay. 
and my, now I know I lied because I know I said the light was coming this way and I got all the light on this side, but that's okay, you know. Hey, it's only a demo. Okay. Got to give me some break, got to give me a break here. Okay, so my tree's got some very, you know, varying degrees of color in it and value in it. But I get the feeling of man, uh, something that's got some strength in it and the light's hitting over here. So we're at the point right now where I sit down and say, all right, what do I really want to do to finish this up? Um, I lost my waterfall, obviously, because what did I do? I just went right over it, didn't I? <laughs> Dummy. Let's see if I can get it back. Well, if I can't, then there's not going to be a waterfall at all. <laughs> God, that aesthetic license goes a long way, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, good Lord. Well, we'll put it over here, maybe. I don't know. Let's we'll see. That's what's nice about watercolor, though. You can lift out and you can play around with it. And... Yeah. Make another one over here. See if you can do that. All right. Some of it is back. I just got to put some sudsy water in there. And where is it going? It's got to be coming from somewhere, Tony. Come on. Maybe it's coming from there. Is that? Maybe it's coming from back there. Who knows? But this is the, this is this this point where you start to really play with this stuff and bring it around, get all of the detail work in there. darker. Let's see what I've been doing is I usually use a combination of alizarin crimson. Well, I mix it. I usually use um, my ultramarine blue with a variation of this red, this red, or this red, depending on what I want to get, where I'm wanna, what I want to try to do here. And I want to sort of darken this up over here. Maybe even darken this up a bit over here. Okay, so I got somewhat of a direction going on in lights and darks. And uh, we'll leave that all white and we'll pretend that that's where it's coming from. That's all. Back and come back in here where it's dry and put some windows in here, maybe do another 
Maybe another building. Chimney, come on, come on. <laughs> okay, so I got a couple of buildings up here. Gives us something to look at. Does that work for you? Is that working out? I don't know. It's hard for me to see. That works, I think. It's this thing down here that we lost. So, I mean, I guess we could play around with it a little bit more, but it's probably about where we want it to be. lightening up on me here. My painting doesn't want to stay dark. Uh, this is damp, not totally, it's not saturated anymore, no. It's, it's still, if you put your fingers on it, you'll, it's still damp. Do you always paint slightly? Yeah, I, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll paint vertically, a lot of times. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I need, I need the benefit of gravity. Uh, when you're painting flat, you know, you, you get, you know, see when I put all of this stuff in over here, it, it ran, it sort of so softly ran down. And that's, that's kind of a nice thing to have happen because uh, when, you, when you're doing that, um, it works out pretty good. Uh, because it creates, it creates something that I couldn't paint if I didn't have the water doing what it does. But that's about, that's about as close as I'm going to get right now without getting into uh, getting away from it and then putting in a little bit more detail. So I'll take this off without ripping it. I'll try to take this off without ripping it. And you know, we'll sort of give you the general 
general feel of this here. Um, maybe put it over, will it fit over here? And I can at least, you know, you can take a look at it from that point. That's it, it works out, it's fine. It works out pretty good. Except for the screen. <laughs> I mean, that, I didn't expect that, but that's a the sunlight, yeah. You know, I gotta tell you something. You guys that paint, oops, sorry, was I in your way? Um, this reminds me of something. Um, when you're painting cityscapes, and you're doing all the buildings, how, how many here are the cityscape painters? Likes all of those buildings, those wonderful buildings. Um, doing those, um, you, can, you can do some, there's a couple of ways of doing it. I think I have one, I think I have a piece in here where I, if I remember correctly, I, I might have brought, yeah, okay. Here's this particular piece here, for instance, I did up in Portland. Okay, and you can see the difference between how, you know, how, how I handled, I handled basically all of these buildings was handled as one shape. That's all it is, it's just one shape. And then, and then once, it was, once it was dry, I just went over and did a little, I mean, you don't put in all the windows, you don't have to put in all of the nuances of the stuff. It, you, can, you get the general impression that it's a cityscape with one big massive shape. And this is what creates, this is what, in, the, all of this stuff here is what becomes interesting. All of the, the you know, the, the little linear work. And you'll notice that everything down here, I'm sorry, once again, Paul, um, but you'll notice it's all dark down here against the lightest lights. And that's where you put in all, my, all the people and so forth. Well, that's one way of handling it. But another way of handling it is to go out and buy um, drywall tape. Nice drywall tape, got a lot of little holes in it, little sticky in the back. You put it down, you paint over it, let it dry, pick it up, and you got a thousand windows. You got to, I'm not kidding you, and I did, I was teaching, I was telling my students this, you know. You don't want to overuse it, that's the problem. You know, you use it for one or two buildings in the background and that works out. And she came back in with a painting and she said, what do you think? And she had drywall tape, drywall tape, drywall tape, drywall tape, drywall tape. And it was just nothing but this massive drywall tape and it, it, painting. And it was just, it was funny because I try to give you, or I try to give people tools to use because I paint with my thumb, I paint with everything. I mean, my straight lines are usually, I do work with credit cards uh, or something like that, and, and I'll run a lot of straight lines, or I'll scrape the buildings in with credit cards. I mean, anything is a tool to use to get the result that you want. The problem that you want is that you don't want to overwork any one uh, sort of tool. But it was hilarious to see her come in with just this beautiful sheet this size. It was nothing but drywall tape, here, 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 all these buildings, and it was kind of funny. So um, that's it, that's my demo for the night. Hopefully you, you actually got something to eat out of it. Um, if there's any questions, that I, I'm more than happy to answer anything else that you want to know. Because the process is... But it's a way to do loose, loose work. Oh, I'm, my pleasure. I mean, hopefully I get, like I said, just, just if it was enjoyable and, and, and it works out, then that's, that's more, more than, you know, because. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've done a hundred of them.